I'm here today to talk about design culture, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important and how we've built design culture at Instagram. And one of the reasons that I think design culture is so important is because it's the thing that really steadies the ship in times of change. And it's really changing all the time on a design team. You know, people are coming, people are leaving the team. Um, sometimes there might be a reorganization at your company or maybe you have a new project that's starting up or one that's winding down. And I found that design culture is really the thing that brings everyone together. And you may be thinking, what exactly does she mean when she says design culture? So I'm going to see if I can use this thing. All right. So I think a lot of times when people talk about design culture, they think about activities like this, like getting outside of the office, going to team dinners or team lunches, playing, you know, doing shuffleboard and guanas. Anyone out here done that? Yeah, got to do that. So, um, and I, I think it's really important to spend time outside of work with your colleagues, getting to know them personally, undoubtedly super important. I just think there's a lot more to design culture than these type of activities. I believe to build a strong design culture, you really need a set of shared values. You need safe spaces to discuss the work and how it upholds your values. And you need ways to share your values as your team grows and changes. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, or tonight rather. It went from day to night in the process of sitting here. So. Um, shared design values. I think, you know, as, as a leader of a design team, it's really easy to just think, oh, when people join my team or if they're on my team, they're going to kind of figure out my values. They're just going to absorb it from everyone around them. And I think it's actually quite important to write down your values. I think the process of writing them makes you really figure out, like, hey, what's important to me? What's important to this team? Um, what do we care about? And see if everyone around you feels the same way. So that was a journey that we embarked on at Instagram about two years ago. We wrote down our values. These are all five of our design values, and I'm going to quickly talk through each of them with work that exemplifies each of these values from our team that's based in New York, because we're in New York, right? So our first um, value that I'm going to talk about is focus on craft. So the most important tool in our process is craft. It evokes creativity, intention, and care. It's a matter of principle and pride. There's humanity in craft, and it leads to better outcomes for our community. So one of the ways that we uphold craft at Instagram is by having a set of designers, who are, and engineers actually, who are focused on maintaining our design standards and our design tools. So we have a designer in each of our offices, as well as a content strategist. They hold weekly office hours. They meet ad hoc with designers to discuss craft and creating the best patterns. So I'll give you just a little more tangible example of what I mean. So they look throughout our entire app. But our design systems team will also look at the most mundane elements. So here I'm showing a bunch of dialogue boxes. You can see where our team has started to diverge in terms of how we're designing. Uh, these dialogues. So what the design systems team is, they came in and created a really clear pattern. So this is great. So anytime you're a designer, you know exactly what the pattern is for dialogues. And then as a user, it's also helpful because it's totally predictable uh, and familiar every time you go to use a dialogue. Similarly, similarly uh, you can see here where our half sheets started to diverge. Uh, and our design systems team worked with all the designers to come up with a pattern that would work for everyone. So this is just a little example of how we really focus on craft at Instagram. Another one of our values is rigorously defined problems. So this is about focusing on people problems, understanding the problems deeply, unpacking big problems into smaller, more manageable ones. Okay, so really weird thing happened a few years ago. We saw that people were posting on Instagram, putting the posts up for a little while, and then deleting them in Indonesia. So we got, we got all these deletions, and we're like, what's going on there? And we thought it was a bug or, or something wrong with how we were logging our data. And when we looked into it, what we found is that people were actually hacking Instagram to shop. And they were posting um, you know, images 
goods that they wanted to sell, and then when it was sold, they would delete the post. And we we're like, huh, that's really interesting. So we went to Indonesia to see what was going on, um, and we saw that people were using our hashtag pages in really interesting ways, ways we hadn't even thought about when we created hashtag pages. So you'll see uh, these are all um, screenshots from user research participants. They're, they're, this is their Instagrams. So here you see, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but it says used coach bag. So people are using hashtags to sell um, secondhand goods. Um, here they're using hashtag pages to actually leave reviews for shops. And we even saw people hacking our search. So they'd go in and type Bandung, which is Shu, Sepatu, which is a city in Indonesia. Uh, and then they could easily find all the shoes in the location near them. And then the businesses were using posts, like e-commerce pages, essentially. So they had pictures, and then they were using our captions. They'd actually write in like all the product details, the sizes, more info. You know, get, hit me up on Twitter. So you're getting like all the information. And we were like, wow, this is so interesting. This is a use case we hadn't planned for, but it seems like our platform is doing a really important role and we want to do more. We want to make it easier to use Instagram to shop. So we've done a few different things. One thing that we've done is on our search and explore surface, we have a destination that's dedicated just to shopping. And we've created tools um, for businesses where they can tag all the products in their photo so you can have more than one product if you want. Here we're showing these boots. And then we've created these product detail pages that the businesses can add all the information about the product as well as other things that they're selling. So this is just one way that we rigorously defined problems, like saw some interesting data, investigated it, figured out what it was that, that people were doing and what they wanted, and then made improvements to our product. Our next value is do the simple thing first. And this is probably the value that I hear mentioned the most. Whether it's design critique or product review, we, we, we use this one quite a lot. And this is really about not over-designing or over-engineering your solutions, improving your designs by removing the unnecessary and perfecting what remains, working to enable and not exhibit. So we were doing some research uh, last year just kind of trying to understand where were people having pain points in feed? How could we improve it? And one of the uh, pain points that came up time and time again is that people would open Instagram, they'd see a post that they really like, and then as new posts loaded in their feed, it would push that post down and they couldn't find it. And this was really frustrating. People felt like the rug was being pulled out from under them. So we wanted to fix it, and we wanted to fix it quickly. So we did a bunch of different design explorations. We looked at, like, maybe you could get new posts from those notifications that come down from the top of your feed. We looked at some different button treatments. We thought about maybe, like, a drawer that lives below stories where you can get new posts. Or maybe we should go, it's kind of blown out here, but to, like, a, sh it's really blown out, but to, like, a shimmering posts uh, model. But what we decided to do was just do the simple thing first, which was let, let people scroll through feed. When new posts um, are ready, let people know. And if they want, they can just click to go to the top of the feed. And so this solved the majority of the issues. We were able to just do it quickly. It's, it's still something we're working through actively in a continuing project. Another value we have is be intentional. Carefully consider your decisions. When you test, test to learn. Don't use testing as an excuse to not finish thinking. Take pride in what you put out. So we were looking at how people were using comments on Instagram. And one of the things that we saw in the data is that people are using emojis a lot. Huge surprise. Uh, but good to check and, and see. And we looked and we're like, yeah, people really want to use emojis. We really want to make it easier for them to use emojis. And there, we also knew through our research that a lot of people wanted to leave a comment, but they just weren't sure what to say. And we thought giving easier access to emojis could help those people get over that barrier. So we did a design sprint. We came up with a lot of cool ideas about how to use emojis. <laughs> I would love to share them, but we might use some of them. So uh, what I'll show you is where we ended up first. And we, we did the simple thing first uh, by integrating emojis into our composer. And so what we ended up doing 
is um, testing two different variants. We had two different hypotheses. On the right, the hypothesis here was people are going, going to want to have access to all of their emojis. They're going to want to have everything possible. On the right here, the hypothesis was that people just want to see a few of their most recently used emojis. So we ran public tests of both of these, and what we found is that people prefer the design on the right. The one on the left just became like paradox of choice. Like, I don't know what the right emo emoji to use is. So this one actually performed better, and we tested it. So it's just an example of being just really intentional about what we were going in and testing, getting quick answers, and shipping a product. And our last value is around uh, being humble. So we're a team that cares about doing great work. Be adaptable and open to others. Be self-aware and careful. Be hard on the work and soft on the people. So this value is really about how we show up for work every day. It's something we think about when we hire because it's really about the people on the team who are going to define the culture. Like They're the ones who are maintaining the culture. And so this is a really important value for us. So that's just a little bit about our design values. And I think design values are great, but it can be just an exercise if you don't put it into practice. You don't want to leave design values on a shelf somewhere. You want to use them. And so we make sure that we create a lot of safe spaces where we can discuss our work and how they align to our values. So um, a lot of times those safe spaces, they're mostly meetings in person or over video conference where we'll, we talk about the work we're doing and we often invoke our values to talk about like why we agree or don't agree with a particular decision. And we have several different kinds of meetings. Um, I'm sure a lot of you all out here have similar things. So, you know, we have like team meetings that are for deep dive topics. We have design critique, which is early iterations. We have a meeting called design review, which designers can sign up for to get detailed UI feedback from design leaders across all of Instagram. And then we have our weekly all hands, which is called design sync, where we take turns sharing our work with each other. So those meetings are certainly one way that we share our values as we grow. But now that we're almost 100 designers, we found that we had to be even more intentional about how we reinforce those values. So I'm going to share a few things that we've started doing. One is really think about that first moment, the day that you join, and what do we do? So what we did is we put together a design goodie box. There's lots of fun stuff in there. And where this arrow is pointing is actually to our design principles. So these are the principles that I walk each of you through. We hand this out on day one. And here you can see some illustrations from uh, one of the designers on our team, Chris Porter. Another way that we reinforce uh, our design values, especially around craft and, and maintaining patterns, is by building our own design tools. So we have an interface kit, a type kit, a glyph kit, and then origami, which is our prototyping software, which you see here. A, nice, a very nice looking file, I do say. <laughs> um, and then not only grown in size, but we've started to grow across different locations. So we have offices in Menlo Park, we have offices in San Francisco, and we also have offices in New York. And so while our values are the thing that bind us together, it still leaves room for each of the office to develop its own personality. Um, and right now, I'd say it's a work in progress in terms of how we're trying to share our values across offices. And I'm actually curious if, if other people have experience with this. I'd love to talk about it more. We have a few things that have started to, to work well for us. One is having uh, designers travel to different offices for design sprints. So just getting in a room, spending time together, solving problems. The other thing we have is very active workplace groups and messenger threads, so it's easy to talk to everyone. And then the last um, thing here, we're calling them design visits. So we'll have culture carriers uh, go to different offices and spend time and embed with the teams from anywhere from two weeks to two months. So to wrap up, uh, I believe the best way to build design culture is to have clear and understandable values, to have forums and safe spaces where you can discuss the work and how it upholds those values, and finding ways to share your values as your team grows and you welcome new members onto the team. So here in the middle, this is actually a New York ritual. We do juice shots every morning. It's juice. 
I promise, it's really juice. Um, and this is us just welcoming one of the newest members to our team. So thank you. Well, Jill, I'm not surprised a couple hands went straight up, so we'll go straight to the Q&A. Um, thank you so much um, for your talk. I do have a question. You talked a little bit about that problem in Indonesia. I was just curious about like timelines around that. You know, you see this problem, how long did it take for something like that to get featured in the app? Yeah, that actually took several years. To tell you the truth, by the time we um, saw what was going on, then the time it took to go and understand it, and then just building a case for what, what is it we thought we needed to do and unpack it, that was probably like a three-year or so timeline, something like that, yeah. Thanks, so it was highly informative. Um, I'd love to uh, get your reaction on how those values meet with monetization and, the, and how ads are integrated and that battle between the values of good user experience and the pressure around monetization. Yeah, absolutely. How do you spend that context? Yeah, I mean, we absolutely invoke these values in that context. I mean, everything we put out needs to be good for people. And I think there's a healthy ten tension in there that, that occurs. But every single thing from our ad products goes through these values, goes through design review. Uh, I work in feed, so ads lives within my product. And so we have a lot of good conversations that come up where we talk about trade-offs, what's the best thing, and we do a lot of testing as well, as well as user research and sentiment to gauge kind of, you know, where, where we think the line is. Okay, hi. Over here. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Is, first question is, is being a design manager and like uh, setting this culture your full-time responsibility? And second question is, if it is, at what point in Instagram's maturity did that become a priority, and how did you sort of build a case for it as a design team? Those are great questions. Um, so the first question was around, is it my full-time job? I mean, I think, yeah, I think a big part of my job is creating the setting to help the culture grow. I really think the design culture comes from the design team itself. And so for me, it's just about helping take the things that I'm hearing and understand and what's important to people and enabling that and repeating it back and reminding people. Like, um, so, I mean, that's kind of part of the design values that I talked about. Collaboration is another thing that's actually really important to me and my team. And we talk about it a lot, and we talk about how we want to be the best team to do it so that we can live up to our own expectations. So I, that is a big part, part of my job. It's not my full-time job. I am still responsible um, for, you know, product output as, as well. And then you had a second part to your question. Say that again. <laughs> oh, I think it was about... Was this always a, a big... Yeah, it is formally part of my role, uh, but not the full part of my role. But I think you asked the second question that was about like when in our maturity. Yeah, when was that integrated into the product? I think, honestly, design's always been at the center of Instagram. It's just always been a big piece of it. And so there's always been a design culture that existed. We didn't maybe have to write it down when it was five, ten designers, maybe, but certainly as we grow and we became more mature, it became more of a necessity to really look at who we are and who we want to be and be able to share that with everyone on the team. Yep. Hi. Hi. You obviously have a very large user base and a very active one. How do you deal culture-wise when things go wrong like that horizontal type thing where everyone's just curious at you, even though it probably was a good idea for many reasons, like just sort of Obviously, you have data to fix it, but like emotions, how do you guys handle that? How do we handle it internally, emotionally? Yeah, I mean, you know, things like that can be frustrating. So the first thing we do is talk about it. Um, you know, we, we talk about it. We figure out why. So even the specific case you're mentioning, there definitely was investigation into like how that happened. Um, and so we look at those things and we're very, internally, we're very open 
nobody's trying to like hide it or be like, oh, this happened. Um, we definitely investigate what's happening, find out why and, and fix it. And then we do like retros on like why it happened and how to make it better. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, so what do you do to ensure that your features would be successful? Like how do you test it before you roll them out to production? Sure, great question. So we do a lot of things to build <laughs> confidence in our designs. The first round is just internal. We have all those meetings I talked about. We first, that's the first thing is we just first go through like, do we think this is good from a design perspective? Um, the other ways that we build confidence is through dog fooding our own product. So that's just a good way to like understand bugs, understand major user flows. But we certainly as a population aren't representative of everyone at Instagram. So once things go through dog fooding, then we move into public tests. So we can do a public test. We, you know, how we roll that test out depends on what we're testing. But you know, oftentimes we'll put out 1% test. And sometimes we'll have different variants, like I showed earlier with that emoji composer test. And so we'll, we'll run public tests and have very clear metrics and understand what's working or not. Now, the metrics will tell you what people are doing, but it won't tell you how they're feeling about it. So we also do, uh, we have a pretty big UX research team. And so we do a lot of sentiment research, understanding how people are feeling as well as what they're doing. So those are all the ways that we build confidence in a particular design. Joe, last one for you. Yep. Hi, I was just wondering, like, with mm. such a huge worldwide app like Instagram and with such a diverse user range, uh, how you go about identifying and prioritizing different <laughs> UX issues you come across? Um, that's a great question. I think prioritization is the key to success. <laughs> um, and there's certainly a lot that we could do. So what we really do try to understand is what's the impact of what we're doing. And so um, any change, we kind of go in and we figure out how much impact will it have. So sometimes that is a numbers thing, like how many people will this affect? Other times it might just be something we believe in and we think is important, like bullying. So it, it totally depends on what the criteria is, but essentially it's usually around how, how many people will this affect and how important of an issue is, is this that we take on, but very important to do. Yes. All right, Jill, what an uh, amazing way to end the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.